Hello, hello, hello. I am delighted, as ever, to have the brilliant Yannis Varoufakis, who has so many hats he wears that I suppose his head is just full of hats. He's a former, of course, Greek finance minister. He's a uh, an, a very esteemed economist, writer, um, political leader. I could go on, Yanis. You've got a lot of hats, as I've said, balancing on your head. Well, I'm glad to be considered your friend and your comrade and your mate. That's um, in this context. <laughs> That's more than sufficient. That's that's the ultimate bauble on the on the Christmas tree. So to say. Um, I will take that. That's I'll, I'll that be my epitaph. Um, <laughs> so yeah, let's, let's let's talk about Gaza now. I think just in terms of a historical context and lens, um, and not just in terms of the specific dynamics of of Palestine occupation. Um, but I spoke uh, to um, uh, Raz Sigal, who's an Israeli-American professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies, for those who aren't aware. And I, what just struck me was the argument he made was that intent is very rarely so overtly spoken mm -hmm. um, in these situations. When you get Benjamin Netanyahu quoting Amalek from the Bible, in which the Amalek nation attacked the Israelites, and then God orders them to kill all men, women, children, and livestock. Um, uh, to, that were fighting human animals, that Gaza were reduced to a city of tents. There were no innocents in Gaza. The West Bank is full of uh, Nazis, two million Nazis. It, it, that It is rare, is it not, for a crime and atrocity to be spoken out with such a lack of subtlety by, by, by those perpetrating it. Um, and yet this is something which the West, Western leaders, governments are openly facilitating. I'm just wondering, just in your thoughts on that kind of just what makes it so striking in that sense? Well, since the, the Second World War, it is unique. There have been uh, genocides. There have been uh, um, awful atrocities perpetrated in French Algeria or Algeria by the French, in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in Iraq, or you name it. Um, there was ethnic cleansing recently in Nagorno-Karabakh. But at least the perpetrators have been trying to hide it, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> trying to cover it up in a veneer of um, um, of, of some humanist endeavor. Uh, but here you had the deputy mayor of uh, Jerusalem only, only the other day, in the, the context of uh, you know men that were stripped down to their underpants and um, treated like cattle. Um, when, when, when this gentleman came out and said that um, uh, if, it was, if it were up to him, he would have ordered a, a huge bulldozer uh, to, to bury them alive. You know, I have never heard uh, a political class, while perpetrating genocide, being so uppity about exactly what they were doing. And so, I mean, it makes our job of trying to argue that there is a genocide going on simultaneously extremely easy and futile because if as you said on oh, the world the world not the world but the governments our governments our ruling classes uh, are prepared to grant the israeli government and institutions the right to commit any war crime in the pretext of um, self-defense then what is there to say, except that, you know, to invoke the Geneva Convention, which is, of course, um, utterly irrelevant, the moment you have this, uh, uh, this, this willingness, especially, I'm, I'm really obsessed with the German government, the German political class, including the party of the left, the Linke, mm -hmm. which is refusing, refusing to answer a really very simple question that I put to my German comrades. Um, we we do have a collective guilt over the Holocaust, but how much Palestinian blood is necessary in order to help us wash that guilt of ourselves? The answer is impossible, because you by adding crime upon crime, you don't cleanse your your conscience. You make it worse. In terms of what this says about the, whatever we call it, the world order governed by Western states, um, Peter Baynar, who is um, the editor at large of Jewish Currents, and he responded to this horrendous statistic, nine in 10 people in northern Gaza are no longer eating every day. Uh, 
mm. according to the United Nations. Uh, and he quote tweeted with, if a U.S. adversary are doing what Israel is doing now in Gaza, liberal hawks in Washington would be calling for a humanitarian military intervention. And if we think back to Kosovo um, mm. and Slobodan Milosevic and the NATO's bombing campaign, then of Serbia Montenegro, I mean, it wasn't, to be honest, even a fraction of the crimes. I mean, it is striking, isn't it, what this says about the pretenses of the so-called humanitarian hawks, the liberal hawks, um, which dominated from particularly the 90s onwards. But the, but what what a lot a lot of the world already thought that was deeply hypocritical and nonsensical. But this is in such striking technicolors. But even back then, Owen, remember they were fashionable and unfashionable victims. So were they victims of ethnic cleansing in Croatia, the region of Croatia where the Serbs lived, and uh, the West simply turned a blind eye to that. Mm -hmm. And then when there was genuine ethnic cleansing by Milosevic in. Uh, the Kosovo suddenly all hell broke loose and you know, German warplanes were bombarding uh, a European capital for the first time after the Second World War. I think that um, in retrospect and especially in light of this um, slaughter of Palestinians, which is um, unprecedented in scale as we speak, we have to come clean. Human rights is a sham. It's an invention by the West. Um, the West, our ruling classes, never intend to grant human rights to people who actually need them. They only use them as a cover, a cover up for um, their brutal, cynical application of what they consider to be their self interest in uh, international affairs, in unleashing uh, violence uh, w without any impunity or without any restraint, and then using the language of human rights selectively, separating victims between fashionable and unfashionable ones, worthy and unworthy, uh, in a manner which is utterly determined by the interests of our oligarchies. Mm -hmm. And they, they would do the same, of course, and they have shown their capacity to do this, not only against brown people, but against our own people. Uh, when I remember, uh, very recently I watched uh, Ken Loach's fantastic movie, The Old Oak, and I was reminded of the experience of the, the miners' strike. You were too young to be part of it. I was. I, I spent eight months going up and down the country. Uh, Owen, look, the brutality that we see in faraway places by the West, by the West that uh, supposedly is moved and mobilized by human rights uh, uh, and the concept of human rights, well, that brutality was shown uh, around England and uh, Wales and Scotland in 1984. We must not forget that. You know, the, the United States government will nuke their own people if uh, that's what it takes in order to maintain the the rights of the very, very few to rule over the many. I should say with the uh, minor strike, I was actually born in the midst of it in Sheffield. So <laughs> I was sort of part of the minor strike because I was taken to rallies, Arthur yeah. Scargill's rallies, which uh, I think I found quite alarming at the age of three months. Um, <laughs> yeah, Arwen Mardawi, who's a Palestinian-American writer, she writes for the Garden US, but she said, you know, I do not want to hear Western democracies lecture the rest of the world on human rights ever again. That's how she began. Um, her article. I mean, just before I talk about the dynamics, this is quite a basic point. I still think it's worth just stating, which is I've worked in the media now um, as an interloper on the left um, for 11 years, 11 years. And I'm not surprised, but I am still shocked about the level of gratuitous dehumanization of Palestinians, that there isn't even a pretense that Palestinian human life has any worth at all, because what is rightly regarded as an intolerable attack on, I don't know, an Israeli civilian, an Israeli child, that there's a limitless amount of death that can be tolerated around 10,000 Palestinian children now, according to pretty credible estimates. I mean, it is, I mean, it's just, it's rare that it's shown in such technical, again, because, you know, in previous the invasion of Iraq, you didn't, you, you had this humanitarian gloss for what was still a catastrophe. But it's that level of dehumanization that people who regard themselves as moderate and centrist and liberal and who often grandstand on foreign policy issues and condemn the outrages 
of the left, supposedly, and yet there isn't even that pretense of Palestinian humanity. Indeed, uh, a couple of points here. Firstly, of, of course, it is the language. Uh, Israeli children, Israeli civilians are slaughtered, Palestinians die. In uh, Israel, you have uh, brutal terrorist attacks. In Gaza, you have explosions. We know all about uh, the language of uh, manipulation and propaganda. But Owen, look, I because the, the, the details of what's happening in Gaza are so uh, so nasty to look at and, and so obvious. I mean, there's nothing much I can say. I mean, everybody can, we share the same information and yet there are people who don't care. And so the big question is, how can their hearts not be broken? How can they continue to legitimize a self-defense? What is clearly mass slaughter? And the answer to that must go back to the concept of terra nullius. You know, when the Brits disembarked in Botany Bay in Australia, they declared the land to be a terra nullius, a land without people. Now, is that not exactly the same dictum as the one on which Zionism is based? A land without the people for a people without the land. The moment you say you're a Zionist and therefore you support the notion that Palestine was free of people in the same way that the British Empire declared that Australia was free of people, well, the process of dehumanizing the people who actually live there, because it's not a land free of people, uh, has already been completed. Uh, the massacre of five million Aborigines um, was not a massacre simply because they weren't there. It was terra nullius. Uh, and what people are there can very easily, whatever they do, whether they smile, sing, or resist, they can very easily be declared to be human animals, sometimes subhuman animals, as the deputy mayor of Jerusalem called them very recently. I just and there's a I mean, lots of people reading this moment a wealth and copy of the Hundred Years War in Palestine uh, by Rashid Khalidi, which I think really puts into context the the that context which is airbrushed out of the Western uh, narrative about Palestine. Just in terms of I'll throw I suppose just narratives which which have dominated the coverage, which is on the seventh of October there was a um, a horrendous attack by Hamas which killed huge numbers of innocent civilians that has traumatized. Uh, Israeli society, and therefore um, there has to be this uh, removal of a murderous terrorist organization. And um, I mean, this is obviously a narrative which it's, it, 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 I mean, it's been talked to death by those who oppose what, what's happening. But I just want, in terms of now, we're over two months on, how much do you think the kind of the attempt to make this, the clock began on the 7th of October, how much do you think now that has actually been challenged and we can actually talk about the, the context which has been erased uh, deliberately? Substantially, in the first couple of weeks after the 7th of October, uh, it, it, you just couldn't get heard. Uh, I remember uh, Gutierrez, the Secretary General of the United Nations, mm -hmm. dared say that uh, after having condemned the atrocities by Hamas against civilians, he added that uh, it didn't happen in a vacuum and uh, the Israeli government condemned him as a criminal, asked for his removal. Uh, and I noticed that for the first 48 hours, the establishment press in Britain, in continental Europe and the United States uh, were taking an approach which was quite uh, inimical, quite uh, confrontational towards me the General Secretary, the Secretary General of the United Nations, but it, five, six thousand uh, dead people later, uh, that has changed, that, that the tide has, has shifted. You could see that in the United Nations General Assembly yesterday, uh, countries that had uh, supported Israel either by voting against the ceasefire, the call for a ceasefire, or by abstaining, now turned and supported it. Uh, so, I hate to say that, but it took a few, you know, a river of blood, of Palestinian blood, to change that tide. 
Regarding the 7th of October attack, uh, I have personally been vilified because I refused to condemn the attack against the wall and the attempt to demolish it and to drive a wedge through it. In my view, every Palestinian not only has a right, whether they're Hamas or not, it doesn't matter. They have a duty to escape from that prison camp. So the trick for humanists, for those who despise anti-Semitism, who are very, very worried that this whole slaughter, massacre, disaster, catastrophe is going to fuel the fires of anti-Semitism. The trick, as far as I'm concerned, is on the one hand to defend the right of Palestinians to perform a prison break while at the same time condemning atrocities against civilians performed by mm. Hamas fighters. Uh, I shall never condemn the attempt to bring down that wall. We should all be there bringing it down, making sure that the people of Gaza uh, are released from that wall. And the same thing applies to Sharon's wall or separation wall in the West Bank. Uh, there is nothing uglier than that wall. Say perhaps for the peace walls in, in Belfast and other such walls between the United States and Mexico. But on this occasion, I think it's essential to distinguish between the duty of Palestinians to bring that wall down and atrocities against civilians, Israeli or not. But do you think the legacy might be, look, either that wall becomes even more entrenched but or it is removed, and the only reason it's removed is that Gaza's Palestinian population is removed, that life is made inhospitable. Uh, and if you look at the... We've all seen the devastation in northern Gaza. It's not inhabitable anymore. Much of it now, the deliberate flooding that's going on, as well as the total destruction of civilian infrastructure, including the destruction, for example, I mean, the, you know, the justice building, which contains public records, civil society is being erased by the Israeli war machine, isn't the danger the legacy will just be either they are more caged than ever in even more catastrophic conditions, or they are ethnically cleansed and driven into the Sinai desert? Honestly, I have no idea. Nobody knows. Anybody who claims to know is either lying or is deluded. But I have to tell you this, that if I were speaking for myself, right, I have no right to generalize from that, but speaking for myself, if I were a Gazan, if I lived in Gaza uh, before the 7th of October, watching the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, other Arab countries, uh, normalizing their relationship with Israel, mm -hmm. essentially declaring that the Palestinians in Gaza, but also in the West Bank, were none of their business. Um, let them quietly die out. <laughs> Let them quietly be ethnically cleansed. Uh, remember, before the 7th of October, 60% of children in G Gaza were malnourished. Mm -hmm. So there was an engineered uh, humanitarian crisis which was kept at a level which uh, would not be on the radar of the Western media, <laughs> but it would essentially drive the Gazan Palestinians uh, into an early grave. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I were a Gazan, I would want to break out and to hell with it. If it meant my death, if it meant that uh, we would all be uh, exiled as a result, for, for Gazans, and I've spoken to quite a few of them, the worst fate was what was happening before the 7th of October, which was a slow march to oblivion without the cameras of the world, without you and me discussing this on your show, without the, you know, um, the Financial Times even um, leading with stories from Gaza. Uh, we need to understand that a people that have been condemned to a, a slow burning death have a duty to rebel and to hell with it. Mm. And I think that's what, what, what happened. This is why the vast majority of Gazans, even though their lives have been completely destroyed now, even though they are facing exile in the Sinai, in the middle of the desert, death through disease, through thirst, through hunger, I have 
little doubt that the vast majority of them do not sit around well, what, what fire they've managed to light up or, you know, <laughs> sitting on bricks in a demolished house saying, oh, what a disaster it was that there was an attempt at a prison break on the 7th of October. In terms of Joe Biden, just hand-wringing, I would describe hand-wringing as a good term to use in the context of what he said this week, which is all of a sudden saying, well, Israel, calm down a bit. You know, almost trying to suggest that perhaps they're going a bit too far. What do you think in terms of, I suppose, not just the context of military aid and the role that plays, but the diplomatic and political cover um, provided by successive US administrations and by, of course, specifically President Joe Biden over the last few weeks, but obviously throughout his whole career, to be honest? Well, the kindest thing you can say about Joe Biden is that he's pathetic. <laughs> uh, be because I'm saying the kindest because it's probably untrue. Uh, he himself, only yesterday, declared himself to be a Zionist. To declare yourself to be a Zionist in the middle of this genocide, essentially to invoke what I said before, the dictum, a land without a people, for a people without a land, is essentially to support the genocide to come out and saying uh yeah let the genocide continue but do it a bit more subtly please do not do not put me in a difficult position vis-a-vis -vis my own public opinion that yeah that is i think it, i'm being very kind calling him pathetic because yeah. you know, essentially this is criminal <laughs> and he knows exactly what he's doing so you know the only thing I can do in the context of giving him the benefit of the doubt is that to say that he's senile and pathetic, but I don't believe that things are so good for him. No, and actually it's quite striking, isn't it, that the consequences of this, because if you look, obviously, Muslim Americans, Arab Americans, but it's much broader than that. Younger Americans are the first pro-Palestinian generation in in history since the foundation of, this, of Israel, according to the polling. Um, and a lot of those voters are not going to come out and vote for Joe Biden. And I know what the response of that wing of the Democratic Party will be. It will be rather they have two options. They could go, we need to listen to what you're saying here. We need to learn. Please tell us your grievances or we will scream at you for being a moral disgrace. How dare you? You have a duty uh, to come and vote for, Bi uh, for Biden. Um, and it's your fault if Trump wins. Uh, and also, we hate you. <laughs> I mean, that's generally the kind of approach of that wing. So I'm just interested. I mean, what do you think is going to... I mean, what are the, the political consequences could well be that Donald Trump wins because of Joe Biden's uh, strategy, if you call it that? You know, Joe Biden and his team, not so much him, but his team, the moment uh, the events of the 7th of October unfolded, uh, they panicked. They panicked because Donald Trump let us not forget, uh, is uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's bosom mate. So the number one priority for the Democratic Party apparatchiks was how not to allow Donald Trump to become the great supporter of Netanyahu and the Israeli establishment. So they became more royalist than the king, more Trumpist than Trump mm -hmm. in uh, advocating for uh, the right of uh, Israel to commit any war crime it pleases in the context of supposedly its self-defense. It was that simple. And for them, losing the support of young, more progressive, lefty, uh, socialistic, liberal, whatever you may call them, voters, uh, was um, a necessary evil in their own electoral calculus. Now, as the rivers of blood flow, it is clear that uh, they are now worried that maybe this collateral damage in the progressive vote, of the progressive vote, is, is becoming too large for them to tolerate. Uh, but you know what? To hell with them. I'm really not interested. There is a genocide happening. It's going to stigmatize the whole generation. It's going to stigmatize us, our children. Uh, it's uh, something that uh, will be discussed a hundred years from now. And Joe Biden's electoral calculus is none of our business 
should be none of our business. We shouldn't really care about it. We should uh, uh, treat him with the contempt that he deserves for having, even yesterday in the United Nations General Assembly, vetoed or voted against the very basic idea that when you've got a population with nowhere to go, they've already been displaced 10 times within and without Gaza. Uh, you're shooting at them like they're fish in a barrel. Uh, nothing short of a ceasefire at that moment is consistent with the right to call yourself human. I mean, do you think, I mean, as you say, I mean, so many genocide scholars have come out and, and said this is genocide. And I think the very least people can do is listen to specialists. It's quite interesting. Yesterday, Danny Cohen, who is the former uh, controller at the BBC, wrote an article damning Gary Lineker. Uh, who's the most famous yeah. sports personality probably in the country, uh, for sharing a video, the video I did with Red Seagal, um, um, saying it was uh, offensive and factually wrong. And I just thought, who's who's better positioned to know about uh, genocide? An Israeli-American professor of Holocaust and genocide studies or the guy who commissioned Strictly Come Dancing and Paul Dark? Um, but, I mean, do, do, do you think, I mean, is it in, in terms of, you know, what people are seeing, I have noticed that it is having, just from the correspondence I get, it is politicising a lot of people. Maybe a lot of people before who didn't really know much about Palestine, hadn't particularly engaged in Palestine, uh, or might have had some sympathy but weren't particularly interested. It is having an impact. And I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. We've lived through years of tumult and, and you know, struggles, defeats. But it is having a big impact, do you not think, amongst particularly a younger generation, politicising them. I just wonder, do you think despite the horrors we're seeing, that we are going to see a much stronger global Palestinian movement than we had before? Maybe, but it's not enough. It's not enough because uh, the speed at which the genocide is proceeding on the ground, in the West Bank, in Jenin, in East Jerusalem, not just in Gaza, is so large, so huge, that uh, whatever the equivalent speed of the build-up of the pro-Palestinian movement amongst the young internationally is simply no match to the events, to the, the swiftness of uh, malignant processes unfolding on the ground in Palestine. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you mentioned, Cohen, there are so many fantastic Israelis and Jews from the diaspora who are... Uh, uh, doing an enormous amount of work in order to make it absolutely clear that nothing of what the Israeli defense force or offense forces are doing in Gaza at the moment can be justified on the basis of uh, ensuring that Jews will never have to face another Holocaust, another pogrom, another anti-Semitic purge. Iris Hevitz, a colleague and friend and comrade of ours, of the M25 movement, um, a couple of weeks ago in Berlin. She's an Israeli Jew. Uh, she's a psychoanalyst who lives in Berlin. She walked onto a square, a city square in Berlin, close to her home, with a placard, which actually said, a banner, which uh, she had written herself, on her own, without anybody next to her. A single woman in her 50s, walking on the street with a banner which read, as an Israeli and as a Jew, stop the slaughter in Gaza. And she was arrested by a white German policeman for anti-Semitism. And the rest of the people around did nothing to protect her, did nothing to impede that white German policeman <laughs> from yeah, arresting this Jewish woman for saying the obvious on behalf of Jews. Now, um, maybe that act by Iris, uh, you know, converted 10, 20 people who saw that uh, um, episode unfold from the sidelines. But, oh, and it's not enough. It's not enough. Let's not try to find solace in the small mercies of uh, a few conversions here and there. Well, bleak. Uh, just a few other things, because I know how busy you are. Um, 
so um, just some questions because I, I posted on Patreon that I was interviewing you and some people are interested in on international institutions, I suppose, like Anoop Kayarat, how do you get the European Union to change tack and face the reality of genocide in Gaza, force a breakup and foreign policy positions um, because of the members, to, uh, between the members to demolish any EU supports narrative. I think it's notable that the EU's uh, constituent governments have shifted quite dramatically to the right over the last few mm -hmm. years in particular. Uh, but also, um, David 74, the UN, he says it's been shown to be ineffectual. Is there any reform? Because it was the UN everybody mm -hmm. capable of affecting change. It's just people just interested in terms of these international institutions. I just wonder what you think. And obviously on the EU, that's something you have particular interest in. Well, the only way of getting other governments in Europe is by threatening their power. So there's a European Parliament election happening in June. We are going to be running. Um, the Democracy in Europe movement, we are, we are going to run uh, with uh, a campaign of uh, peacemaking in Ukraine, in Gaza, in Yemen, in Kashmir, uh, with uh, a campaign for uh, basic income. Because let us not forget that there is also a war against the weak Europeans across Europe. Mm. Inequality has reached a level which is um, uh, bordering on uh, uh, the, the, the misanthropic. Uh, the, the, we need to counter the ultra-right and the authoritarian establishment, which is also Zionist, at, at the same time as being anti-working class within the European Union. It's a tall order, but there's no alternative to that. As for the United Nations, you know, people dismiss the United Nations as a talking shop. Well, it's important to have a talking shop, because what happened in the General Assembly yesterday? There was a vote. And the vast majority of countries around the world voted for a ceasefire and created the circumstances to expose the duplicity and complicity of the United States that voted against, and of course, of the United Kingdom that abstained dishonorably and in a cowardly fashion. That's the role of the United Nations. You know, more than 100 people working for the United Nations have been killed in Gaza. Their death means something. Their death is going to signal to the rest of the world that um, humanity is being tested in Gaza. That is a sufficient contribution by the United Nations. The rest is up to us. We need to organize in our countries and run campaigns and run in elections and contest elections in order to scare the living daylights out of our governments that if they do not change tack on this, on the genocide which is being perpetrated as we speak, we will overthrow them through the ballot box. I mean, just finally, I mean, this, it's, I suppose, maybe the answer to this is just things are bleak and that's that's how things are. Um, but, you know, the conclusion one could just draw is the Palestinians are going to suffer a gruesome um, fate, which will, in practice, mean the permanent ending of any attempt of nationhood um, in a particularly murderous fashion, which will destroy their society. I mean, this is why people talk, obviously, about genocide, that the very nation of being, the very notion of being a Palestinian um, will be murderously ended as an, as an identity in, in, in the future. I mean, what, is there any hope? I mean, can you see any prospects, not least because the problem in Israel is you've had such a dramatic shift there to the right, the peace movement there is on its, on its knees. It's becoming an increasingly overtly authoritarian, even when on its own terms within his Israeli society, let alone, you know, its occupation of a authoritarian, undemocratic um, system. Um, what, is there any hope of, of any description? And what do you think the long-term implications will be? Because a lot of the world has just looked at this horror and atrocity. And I think they're drawing some pretty grim conclusions about the nature of the world in which they live. There is hope. Uh... Hope never dies as long as we are alive, as long as one single person is alive, as long as one Palestinian is alive. Look, you know where I'm, I'm getting hope from? From within Israel. Because, yes, the peace movement has died. The Labour Party has become putrid and in, in, irrelevant. But when you have somebody like Tamir Pardo, who was handpicked by Benjamin Netanyahu in 2011 to lead Mossad, Mossad, yeah? <laughs> don't need to add anything, <laughs> Mossad, and he comes out in support of Palestinian rights to condemn that the Israel for imposing a state of apartheid 
Huh? All those young men and some women in the Israeli army now who, are, who have blood on their heads in Gaza, I refuse to believe that they are happy with what they are doing. I think the next peace movement will come out of them, who will come back and at some point will tell their own people that, you know, what you did in Gaza was a crime against humanity that we feel very ashamed of. And also, you know, the Palestinians, I will say something that may sound callous, but I'm saying it in the nicest possible way. They're very hard to kill. <laughs> they have a remarkable staying power. Uh, they are killing a lot of them. But with every one child that they kill, they create 10 militants. And I hope that those militants will be humanist, that they will not become what the West calls terrorists. So between the young soldiers, Israeli soldiers, who will go back and reflect on what they have been doing in Gaza, and the new militants that are springing up everywhere in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, in Gaza. I want to hang on for dear life to this hope that they will be from the river to the sea, and I mean this point provocatively, from the river to the bloody sea, they will be a movement for granting equal human rights to every single person between the river and the sea, independently of what language they speak, what God they worship. I personally hope they all become atheists because I'm one. Um, and then we can decide about borders, we can decide about um, municipalities, about states and all that. But we need to maintain the hope that in the end, uh, freedom and human rights, uh, the very human rights that the West is uh, invoking in order to cancel, nevertheless, they have an intrinsic value that is consistent with what is innate in human nature and we will manage to overcome. Good, a hopeful place to end. I was I was concerned we might never reach it, but as ever, I do, I always feel more hopeful when I speak to you guys. So um, it's good to have a therapy session as well as an interview, but it's good to be able to put this in its, the horror which we're seeing every day in its, in its broader context and, and to talk about possible hope for the future. Um, uh, for those watching or listening, please like and subscribe. But a huge thank you very much to the brilliant Yanis as ever for sharing his wisdom and his thoughts. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you. Thank you.